Good afternoon, and for those of you joining us from across the country and around the world, good morning and good evening. Welcome to the first webinar of our 2021 educational webinar series. Today's topic is phage therapy. I am Amy Leitman, president of NTM Inform Research, and I will be serving as moderator for today's session. On behalf of all of us at NTMIR, thank you for joining us. The topic for today's webinar is phage therapy, and we're delighted to welcome today's featured guest speakers, Dr. Kira Cohen and Dr. Graham Hatful. Dr. Kira Cohen is a specialist in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins, where she directs the Johns Hopkins Center for Non-Tuberculous Mycobacteria and Bronchiectasis. She's an expert in the care of patients with NTM pulmonary disease, bronchiectasis, and critical illness. As an assistant professor of medicine, her research is dedicated to improving the diagnosis and treatment of NTM infections. Dr. Cohen holds an MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Graham Hatful is a professor of biological sciences and the Everly Family Professor of Biotechnology at the University of Pittsburgh. He received his PhD in molecular biology from Edinburgh University in 1981 and did postdoctoral work at Yale University with Dr. Nigel Grindley and at the Medical Research Council at Cambridge University with Fred Sanger and Bart Barrell. He joined the University of Pittsburgh in 1988 and served as chair of the Department of Biological Sciences from 2003 to 2011. Dr. Hatful's research focuses on the molecular genetics of the mycobacteria and their bacteriophages and their use for educational advancement. Dr. Hatful has published over 240 peer reviewed articles 43 book chapters or reviews, and has co-edited four books. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, a fellow of the American Association for the Adman Advancement of Science, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor since 2002. During today's webinar, you may ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Click on the Q&A icon, on your screen, type your question into the box, and then click send. At the conclusion of the presentation, the moderator will read questions from the queue for the speakers to answer. Today's webinar broadcast is being recorded and will be posted online at the conclusion of our seminar series. So if you will miss the answer to that question that is asked, you will have the opportunity to hear it again. You can find more information about NTM lung disease and NTMIR at ntminfo.org, where you can also sign up for our electronic newsletter. Follow us on social media, including Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And now I'd like to turn this event over to today's guests, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Hatful. Thank you both for being here today. Dr. Hatful, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me... Uh... Navigate. Uh, now, is this visible? Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, uh, Amy. It's a delight to be here and to have an opportunity to tell you a little bit uh, about uh, bacteriophages and, and and bacteriophages for the for the NTM bacteria and their potential therapeutic uh, utilities. I'm as as uh, Amy said, I'm a a, a basic biologist um, at the University of Pittsburgh. We study all sorts of aspects of the microbiology of NTMs and the bacteriophages. Um, although we are interested in the potential therapeutic utilities of phages and so um, much of what I'll talk for the next few minutes is about the, the the basic properties of phages and how we go about isolating them and characterizing them and I think we should have lots of uh, uh, time uh, after these presentations to entertain questions about any aspect of that. Let me just say by context uh, up front where I think that we're really at with the question of uh, can phages be used therapeutically to treat NTM infections? On the good side, we have some uh, experience now that at least in a small number of patients where therapy has been attempted, it seems to be uh, have a good safety profile and, and, and to have had some, some, some success. So there's promise there. The challenge is that what works for one patient in terms of phages and their treatment 
doesn't necessarily work for another patient. Uh, and figuring out that translation is one of the key questions that we're interested in. But understanding the phages and how they work uh, is really one of the critical parameters to advancing uh, that goal. Okay, so um, bacteriophages are uh, sometimes referred to as phages, as, as for, for, for as an abbreviation, and they are simply viruses. They're a type of, they're a class of viruses. They are viruses that infect bacteria. So viruses are very common. We've all become very familiar with SARS-CoV-2, the cause of, uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19, but bacteriophages have very much uh, a similar set of properties. They can't replicate by themselves. Um, if you just put, have them in a tube, nothing happens. They're absolutely dependent upon a host, a living host in which to replicate. Uh, and so replication and growth of phages is strongly host dependent, where the host in this case is a particular bacterium. Like all viruses, bacteriophages are pretty specific for the host that they infect. So phages infect particular types of bacteria uh, and at different levels of specificity, as we'll talk, talk about. But they don't infect human cells. They don't infect mammalian cells. They don't infect plant cells. They actually don't infect many other bacterial cells or strains or species other than the ones uh, that they that they'd like to infect and, and replicate on. And they come in lots of different types, but here's some examples of some of them, what the more common ones look like when we look at them in the electron microscope. The population at, at, at large in the, in the biosphere of phages is really amazing. Uh, it's known from simply doing numerical counts there's approximately 10 to the power of 31 phage particles in the biosphere. That's a huge number and a lot of zeros, but uh, it's, it's, just, it's just huge. It's, it, it means that phage particles of this type here, they are the majority of all types of biological stuff of life in the, on the planet there's more bacteriophage particles like this than all of, all of the forms of life taken together. So they're very abundant. The population is very dynamic because these phages are constantly infecting bacteria in the environment everywhere that you look. And they're very old. They probably go back to the very early days of life. And because of these parameters of the population, bacteriophages are very... Um, diverse genetically. There's just many, many different types, many, many different genes, so many to be explored. And what we know is about is only a very, very, very minuscule fraction of all of those particles that exist out there in the biosphere. How do we know this and how do we get a hold of them and how do we grow them? So because they're abundant, there's if you put a spoonful of, uh, stick a spoon in, say, this compost heap or in a pond, um, you, you're going to have perhaps a million or 10 million phage particles present just in there. Now, remember, they're very specific for the different kinds of bacteria. So they infect different types of bacteria, usually the bacteria that you find in these similar environments. Um, but that's how you can isolate them. So um, we would scoop up uh, some sample, like, for example, this compost heap at the bottom of my yard, add some simple liquid, stir it up, filter to get rid of like the, 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 the larger clumps and soil, et cetera, in there. And then we essentially mix some of that solution with the bacteria that we're looking to isolate phages for and then spread them onto this, uh, this Petri dish here. We're looking down on top of a Petri dish and the plates are, are, are incubated. So the bacteria grow to form this, um, this white, uh, whitish looking lawn. Um, so the bacteria are smothering the whole of the surface. And then you can see these holes, what look like holes, which are called plaques. This is a very old assay called the plaque assay. Each of these plaques, is formed by a single phage particle, 
that's present in the original sample. And it is now replicating and growing on the bacteria so that by the time you see one of these plaques, I'm just showing you a couple of examples here. By the time you can see that plaque, there's up to 100 million particles in that plaque. And that's because this particular phage has been able to infect and replicate on this particular bacterium. And so the kinds of phages that you get when you do this depend very much on the specific kind of bacterium that you use. Um, and we have a lot of experience using uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria for doing this kind of isolation. When I say we, um, we have actually been involved in leading a large consortium uh, in a program called the so-called Sea Phages Program. The C has nothing to do with the oceans. It stands for a, a program called the Science Education Alliance um, run by my colleagues at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And this program has been set up for students to be able to do what I just described as part of an activity for immersion into doing scientific research and, and, uh, and, and, and discovery, scientific discovery. And so we actually have had thousands of students at many different institutions uh, do this process. And this has helped to generate a large collection of, of uh, bacteriophages, which has been incredibly helpful in advancing many interesting questions, but including the potential therapeutic utility. So we have focused on phages of the mycobacteria, and I'm just showing you some examples of the weird and wonderful types that you can see when you look at what their bodies actually look like. Specificity is the key issue here. I've mentioned it before. I'm going to focus it on again. Specificity of the phages is a double-edged sword. So phages infect often only bacteria within a, a, a lower area of the taxonomy of life, typically only bacterial uh, types within a particular species. They can but rarely infect. One, one particular phage will not infect bacteria from, a, from different genera. And many phages only infect some strains, but are not all strains within a species. The types of bacteria that any particular phage infects is referred to as the host range. You, you can't guess what the host range is for phages. You really have to do it empirically, meaning you actually have to do an experiment with a particular phage in order to ask the question, which types of bacteria can this phage infect using the assay described above, the plaque assay. Therapeutically, and thinking about phages therapeutically, this specificity is this double-edged sword. On the one hand, it is absolutely magical for providing precision targeting of a particular pathogen in a patient without interfering with the rest of the microbiome. I think it's broadly understood the impact of uh, treating patients with antibiotics, which are often broadly acting and tend to clean out large parts of the microbiome. It's just like carpet bombing as opposed to precision targeting. So the, the, the specificity is a very attractive feature of phages for therapy. On the other hand, it causes this concern that a particular phage won't be useful for more than a small number of patients because the specificity is so high that you can only treat it, use it to treat a subset of strains and therefore a subset of patients um, because of this high specificity. I, I mentioned that we do have this large collection of mycobacteriophages, about 10,000, and 3,000 of these have been genomically defined so we know what they're genomes and their genes look like. And that's how we can try to figure out what type of phage it is and what, what groups we can put them in. However, most of these were isolated on this bacterium called Mycobacterium smegmatis, a non-pathogenic uh, non um, mycobacterium. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work to try to find out what subset of these can infect some of the pathogenic 
mycobacteria such as mycobacterium abscessus. And we've been able to identify those phages um, and we've tried to find out which clinical isolates can be infected and which cannot by these phages. If you try to do that phage isolation process that I described using mycobacterium abscessus, um, you can do that, but very few phages have actually been isolated by doing that process. It seems to be very inefficient and we're not sure why. It's an important question, um, but we have made use of these mycobacterium smegmatis phages and isolating the subset whose host range extends to some of the pathogenic mycobacteria. So we actually have a good, a small but good subset of phages that are active against some clinical isolates of mycobacterium abscessus and some other pathogenic NTMs. But I would emphasize that so far there's relatively few that infect mycobacterium avium. And this, this remains a, a major uh, a question that needs to be addressed. Can we collect uh, a large collection of phages useful for uh, therapy against mycobacterium avium. So we have been involved in preparing some phages for, for therapeutic utility. Um, the purification is relatively simple, but it's possible using basic lab techniques uh, to, to, to get highly purified fractions of the phages that are really quite concentrated. And this is just a, a, an illustration of, of what that looks like and part of that process. This is what the some of them look like in the in, in the electron microscope. I, I showed you some before. In this particular case, we were looking to go and, and treat a patient with, with, with some phages. And so it's helpful and important to show that these phages can actually kill the bacteria in the test tube very effectively. And we do this type of assay, which is an illustration of, of that. We're just looking at bacterial at spots of bacteria growing on a, on a, on a, in a Petri dish. And this is just a, a, a dilution of bacteria in the top here growing um, just as the bacteria alone. And you can see this white area reflecting bacterial growth. And then below are a set of conditions where we've incubated the bacteria together with different amounts of the phage and then to see if they can grow. And the little white dots here are simply where the material has been added to the um, agar plate. Essentially, you can see no bacterial growth in most of these, which reflects really good killing of these bacteria by, uh, this partic by these particular set of phages. And so those are the phages that we use to, to treat the first um, mycobacterium infection uh, with phages uh, that's been described. Um, this is Isabel, 15-year-old with cystic fibrosis and a bilateral lung transplant uh, uh, with immunosuppressive drugs to, to protect the, lung, the, the new lungs, uh, but then with a debilitating disseminated mycobacterium obsessus infection, which was refractory to, uh, to, to antibiotic treatments and essentially um, was, was transferred to palliative care. We helped to prepare this three-phage cocktail that I just showed you, demonstrated that those bacteria, that those phages can kill the bacteria in the test tube, prepared them for administration, and then these were administered IV twice daily with topical administration to the uh, skin nodules that are characteristic of these kinds of diseases. The bottom line is that no adverse reactions, a very good safety profile, and substantial clinical improvement. I'm not going to show you a lot of the gory details, but I want to illustrate that there was a severe um, infection with the bacterium in the liver, as illustrated by this scan. And then six weeks later, you can see that this is completely resolved. And then the skin nodules have resolved with the phage therapy, and the sternal wound from the transplant has been uh, resolved uh, uh, as well. So we have a very good outcome here, and Isabel has essentially been able to return to pretty much a normal life. Um, however, for this to work, this phage cocktail had to be personalized for this particular strain. We called this strain GDO1. It was very effective for Isabel 
it is not effective for most other patients, for most other strains. And we've been examining that and trying to understand the, the genetic and the molecular, the biological basis for why that happens. And we've been trying to understand why this will work for some strains and not others. And this is an active area of discovery that we're looking at. I just want to say a brief thank, thank you to some key players who have uh, advanced this, uh, this, uh, this work, especially on the therapeutic aspects. Um, I'm now going to turn this over to, uh, to, to Kira, and then we'll uh, do questions at the end. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing here and over to you, Kara. Great. Thanks. Let me load my slides. OK, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you, Amy, for the invitation. Um, I just to Amy already introduced me, but to, to take a step back, I'm a physician scientist. I work at Johns Hopkins, where I direct the Johns Hopkins Center for Non-Tuberculous Mycobacteria and Bronchiectasis. And my interest in knowledge in phage has been recent. Um, I met uh, Dr. Hatful. Um, I had met him uh, many years ago, but I, I met him more recently um, a year ago when I too was in search of novel therapies for my patients with NTM lung disease who have not responded to a whole host of traditional therapies. And that, in that context, I met Dr. Hatful, made some connections and um, began treating a single patient here at Johns Hopkins with phage. And I'm not gonna tell you about that experience today, but I will tell you in um, more general terms about phage therapy and we'll review why we're reaching to these um, modalities of treatment what the logistics of treatment are and discuss uh, the future for phage at the end. So just to take a step back, um, we, for most infections, we use antibiotics. For most bacterial infections, I should say, um, we use antibiotics, but our, our tools for antibiotics have been limited. In particular, there's been a rise of drug-resistant infections. And in 2019, the CDC put out some information that there's close to 3 million um, unique infections with drug resistant bacteria and uh, fungi in the US. And about close to 36,000 people die in the US every year due to drug resistant infections. And um, to, to give you some history on antibiotics, we've been using antibiotics since the early 20th century. Um, and there's a whole host of different antibiotic classes that are available for our use. However, pretty soon after antibiotics have been distributed, we start to see that drug resistant bacteria are emerging. And so you can see here on the top, this is a timeline of when the antibiotic was first discovered and later put into use. And then when we first noted on the bottom drug resistance to that particular bacteria. And you can see in general, it's only separated by a short number of years. So here's a, a quick a humor break for us. So here's, um, uh, this is a bacteria standing at the front of a graduation classroom and here, are a class of graduating bacteria and the, the, the graduation speech says to them, you're the next class of drug resistant bacteria. As humans continue to abuse and overuse antibiotics, your ranks will swell. So get out there and mutate. And remember that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Um, and so, you know, we as physicians and as uh, people who take antibiotics have some role to play in the threat of antibiotic resistance, but it's not just healthcare in those settings. This is also interconnected. Um, in particular, agriculture and the farming industry has a ton of use of antibiotics. There's environmental factors at play as well. Um, antibiotics aren't only man-made. Um, antibiotics were discovered from bacteria as this old warfare of a cat and mouse game. And so there's some natural resistance that exists as well. But nonetheless, antibiotic resistance is preventing us from best treating people with serious infections. 
And our pipeline to for antibiotic discovery is limited. And so this is just a look at over five year increments, our pipeline of how many new drugs we've developed for cancer in red and antibiotics in blue. And you can see that in recent years, we've developed many new antibiotics for when many new drugs for cancer, but our antibiotic pipeline has gotten woefully smaller. And were this graph to continue for the last five years, um, you could see that this, this looks even more prominent, that we have overwhelming tons of options for cancer, very few options of novel bacteria. Uh, for novel antibiotics. And of the antibiotics that we're developing, most of them aren't truly new. They're just slight modifications from classes of antibiotics that we already know about. And so they may not work better or very differently than the antibiotics that we currently have. So let's talk about phage therapy. Um, so what is phage therapy? And uh, Dr. Hatful alluded to this in his talk earlier. So phage therapy is when we administer a virulent phage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, and we give the phage directly to a patient with the purpose of killing the bacteria that's causing infection in this patient. And let's just do a quick compare and contrast of antibiotic therapy and phage therapy. And Dr. Hatful has reviewed some of this already. But phage, it, phage is really like a sniper. You know, the phage goes in with a gun and it really looks to take out exactly one particular bacteria that's causing damage. Whereas when we use antibiotics, we have both good and bad bacteria in our bodies. And it, it's kind of like throwing a pipe bomb in. You get a lot of shrapnel going all places and it can kill your, not only its intended target, but also destroy your normal flora and have side effects related to that. Phage um, have a property of self amplification, which is that when they get into a bacteria, they can then multiply. So they burst that bacteria and they send their little daughter uh, phage out to um, infect other bacteria. And so um, th there's the possibility that if you, even if you just get one phage exactly where it needs to go in a person to the site of infection, that the phage will amplify there and kind of kill off its neighboring bacteria, just like it did on the dish in the plaque assay that Dr. Haffel shows where one phage can ultimately clear all of its bacterial neighbors in a radius around it. The same thing may happen in the human body. Um, there's other issues relating to, to clearance. There's possible immune clearance. You know, phage are not supposed to be in our body. Our body may look at for, out for them and, and take them away. Um, but this is in contrast to antibiotics. In antibiotics, our, our body um, usually um, has a way to break down antibiotics and clear them. So if you give a single dose, there's no self-amplification of antibiotics that are given. You give one molecule of antibiotic, it works until it stops working, and then it's cleared. And so we need to redose antibiotics frequently. Um, there's no direct immune clearance of antibiotics, and uh, antibiotics are cleared in general by the, the kidney or the liver, depending on the antibiotic. Um, and for both phage and antibiotics, in order for them to work, we need to get the, either the phage or the bacteria to the site of infection. The safety of phage, as uh, Dr. Hatful alluded to, is um, this is very um, novel technology in some regards and that we're only recently studying the safety profile of this and so it's not fully established how safe phage are to use. Whereas antibiotics, we've had them for a long time, we know very well um, what their side effects are and we have very well described side effects and allergies to these agents. Um, for phage, as I said, this is, we have less evidence to support their use in contrast to antibiotics, where we have a lot of clinical experience to tell us when to use antibiotics, what dose, for how long, for which patient, for which infection. And then lastly, for phage, just like antibiotic resistance is possible, resistance of bacteria to phage is also possible. And uh, although the frequency of with this in which it occurs is unknown. And for antibiotics, as we spoke earlier about, antibiotic resistance occurs frequently and can really limit the use of antibiotic therapy for humans. 
So just to take a step back to history, um, Dr. Felix Durel was the father of clinical phage therapy. So uh, pardon my high school French accent, but he was a Canadian, a French Canadian microbiologist at the turn of the 20th century. And he was the first one to name phage, bacteria phage. Um, and it comes from bacteria and the Greek phagin, which means eater. And so bacteria phage literally are particles that eat bacteria. And not only did he coin the term, he also was the first to use phage clinically. Um, and this was in 1919, and there was a 12-year-old boy in Paris um, who was hospitalized with a case of dysentery. And true to form of many um, physician scientists at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Durel and some of his colleagues first ingested phage themselves um, by mouth to see whether or not it was, was harmful. And when it wasn't, they gave it to this 12 year old boy who was actually cured of his dysentery with a single dose of phage. And that is the first reported history of phage for clinical use. So just to, to take a timeline, um, this is a timeline of both the use of phage and antibiotics. And to orient you, this is the introduction of penicillin in 1942. But I told you on the previous slide that it was 1919 that we first had the first use of clinical phage. Um, and on this graph here, you can see in the, this yellow greenish color here that in the early 20th century and really the first half, there was tremendous use of phage. And it wasn't until um, the mid 20th century when we had a lot of other options of antibiotics and the modern antibiotic era came in that we saw a rise of antibiotic therapy and with that phage therapy decreased. And so, you know, why use phage when we have antibiotics that we can um, more mass distribute and have more predictable outcomes. And so for a large part of the 20th century, more recently, antibiotic use has far eclipsed phage therapy. And it's only within the last um, several years that people have had a renewed interest in phage therapy because we're seeing um, limitations to our use of antibiotics from drug resistance and the inadequate pipeline that we reviewed earlier. Um, so I have one more date to put on this timeline and that is from 2019. And this is um, a picture of from the guardian of the patient Isabel that Dr. <coughs> Hatful, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> successfully treated with um, intravenous use of mycobacteria phage for mycobacterium abscessus, as he told you about earlier. So moving on, um, what are what are we currently using phage for? Well, um, you know, we're not really using phage for anything where an antibiotic alone would do the trick. Um, we're trying to use phage for it, it, circumstances where there's significant drug resistance, there's significant limited treatment options, or the site of infection is incredibly challenging. So in particular, there's been a rise of people using phage um, when there's implantable devices, such as ventricular, ventricular assist devices, which is like an artificial heart or when there's grafts, um, kind of arterial grafts, like aortic grafts inside, when there's foreign body or material, which create a biofilm that's very difficult for antibiotics to penetrate and phage may have an easier time getting in. And then of course, the reason that we're talking to NTM Info and Research is because there's a burgeoning interest in using phage to treat NTM. So how should we give phage? There's a lot that we don't know. Um, over the century, uh, the last century in which phage have been being used, um, people have tried all of these methods to deliver phage. I told you that um, the first use of phage was by mouth. Um, the case of Isabel with phage for mycobacterium abscessus was through the, her veins with intravenous injection. And people have also used phage topically and in a nebulized inhaled form or with um, Similarly, we don't know how best to deliver phage. This is such personalized medicine that um, we don't know whether it's the best way to use phage as a cocktail, as was done with Isabel, with three different phages being used together, or if perhaps we should give them in sequence if we have more than one option to give phage. So first one phage, then a second phage, and then a third phage. 
And so this is something that we still don't know the best route of administration or even the strategy of a single or a, a combination approach. What about efficacy and safety? Um, so this is not for NTM data. This is the largest review that I could find of a systematic review of over a, a little over a thousand patients who received phage therapy in 30 different unique investigations. Um, instead of mycobacteria, they're going after these six kind of bad acting bacteria or the escape pathogens, which I've listed here. The, um, the methods, the route of administration was all over the map. So there was a smattering of topical, IV, oral, inhaled, multiple different routes, don't know, the methods didn't say. Um, so it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. And then in terms of efficacy, this was labeled as on a per study basis of the 30 studies rather than on a per patient basis of the 1,152 patients. But they reported efficacy by each study had their own definition of success in 87%. And then for safety, um, there is again, the majority of studies did not report any bad side effects to phage. Um, there were eight studies that didn't have enough information. So there, um, it was either, there was no information on side effects with phage or it was inconclusive. And then on two studies, there were some side effects noted, um, but the, these were infections, eczema, nausea, or vomiting. And it's unclear whether those side effects were actually related to the phage or just temporarily occurred after the phage had been administered. So this, it's, you know, as a scientist, it's hard to make a lot of conclusions from this when it, you know, it, a thousand people sounds like a relatively large number, but when you think about how many people and how diverse these patients were, how diverse their treatment strategies were, um, it's, it's really hard to draw some rigorous conclusions. So how about the logistics of phage? So what's, what's, what's the, what are the current mechanisms for accessing phage therapy? So this starts, uh, you know, I wrote from bench to bedside, but this really starts at the bedside. So first it's a conversation between a patient and a physician as to whether or not a patient is interested in pursuing phage therapy um, uh, with the uncertainties regarding both efficacy and safety. And after this discussion, if you decide to proceed with phage um, therapy, then um, the laboratory either has to save the bacteria that this patient is infected with, or hopefully retrieve if they have it saved in the freezer. And then this needs to be sent to the laboratory where um, that, that handles phage, because these are often not one in the same. Um, and it, in order to, to send um, medical specimens from one institution to other institutions, there's lawyers and paperwork involved, and there can be a tremendous time delay of a couple months even to get this paperwork completed. After the bacteria have been received by the phage lab, such as Dr. Hopfel's lab, then he needs to do, um, his lab does different testing, which he showed you earlier, to see whether or not any phage in their libraries are um, efficacious at killing these bacteria. So does, when you put the phage on these bacteria, does it create plaques? And in many cases, as he said earlier, for certain species or for certain bacteria that just don't have a match, this is unsuccessful and the phage quest stops here. Um, if you're lucky and that there is a match, then the physician um, needs to develop a treatment plan for how phage are gonna be administered. Um, and they can do this in conversation with other physicians who've um, used phage therapy and decide whether you're going to give it IV or uh, inhaled, which dose, how often, for how long, what are you gonna to monitor to know whether things are working or not working. Um, and this gets submitted to the FDA as what's called an IND, an investigational new drug. Um, the FDA has 30 days to respond to your initial request. Um, and their response could be that they have additional questions. <laughs> And, um, but presuming that everything, you can agree upon a treatment plan with the FDA, then, um, then this needs to go back to the institutional um, review committee. So um, for example, the Johns Hopkins IRB needs to approve the use of any um, product that has an IND associated with it. And that timeframe is again, 
variable. And then only after all of this has, has, has succeeded can phage be then shipped to the research pharmacy or to the clinician in order to be administered to the patient. So this is quite a tour de force. So how often does this work out? So um, I've pulled the data from um, San Diego. They have a, um, a program called IPATH, um, which is involved in phage. Um, sorry, I'm closing something in my computer. And they reviewed that in a, the, a year and a half, they received 785 requests for phage. In 99, for 99 people, they actually started a phage hunt. Um, and some of this was that it wasn't deemed appropriate or the patient died in the process of while they were looking for a phage. Um, only in half of people who, whom they had started a phage hunt did they find a match. And in 17 patients did they actually begin treatment. So this is a little depressing, you know, when you take 17 out of 785, that's a pretty small number. That's a little more than 2%. And then how long did this take? So the median time from when people started this process to actually administer this process was 170 and a half days, although the range was between 28 and 386. And I'm, I'm really impressed by the 28. So what's next? Um, you know, this is a, an incredibly, as I said, um, there's a lot of things that we don't know. We don't know how best to, we don't know exactly which infections to use phage for. We don't know exactly um, what route, what dose, how to scale this from being an individual product that we um, do one off a ton of paperwork um, that is, um, I, I should also mention is not only is this time consuming, but it's also not um, uh, an activity, it's reimbursable and it often Im involves um, people loaning their time and philanthropic funds to getting this off the ground. Um, so this is something that we're, I think we're gonna need to come together as both a scientific and a patient community to think this through as to how to scale this. Um, but I think there's room for optimism. I think that there's, um, I, I see that our antibiotic pipeline is getting smaller and antibiotics are our mainstay for certain infections, but I, I think there is a role for phage in some point in the future. So just to wrap this up for, um, in conclusion, Phage therapy actually predates antibiotics. Um, there's been a recent well-deserved rebirth of phage, in particular due to the antibiotic challenges that we've seen with the inadequate pipeline and drug resistance. There's a lot that we need to do in terms of figuring out how to use phage, who should be treated, how should we give it, um, and we need to not only do to, to give phage in different ways, but we also need to study how we're doing this, write it down and disseminate those results for other people to share our experience so that we can collectively all learn together how better to do this. And then the paperwork burden, you know, 170 day average is our median is, is too long. Um, it's a lot of work. It's too slow and burdensome for the people on this. So we need to figure out how we can hasten this product. So lastly, I do think that there's tremendous clinical potential for harnessing phage for use, and it's something that we'll have to sort out together in the next years to come. Um, I did want to alert you to some popular press readings on phage. There was a New Yorker article in late December of 2020 um, called When a Virus is the Cure. And similarly, there's another book that was published called A Perfect Predator, which is about a scientist's own journey. Um, he actually, uh, a scientist himself, was treated with phage therapy at uh, UCSD. Um, and uh, so I like to point you towards those resources. And to say thank you, I'd really like to say thank you to the patients who participated in clinical trials, um, in particular um, patients who've participated in phage therapy um, and uh, therapeutics for NTM. I'd like to thank Dr. Hatful and his lab group for helping me access phage therapy for my patient, my colleagues at the Center for NTM and Bronchiectasis and in my laboratory and NTO, NTM Info and Research for giving us this opportunity in this platform to talk to you guys today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you both taking the time. We have a, a number of questions actually um, to ask now. And uh, I'm gonna 
I'm going to let you guys um, decide who to take, uh, who should take those um, questions, but I'll, I'll start with clinical trials. That seems to be a very popular one. Um, are, are there any clinical trials that are going on right now for phage therapy in NTM or like, do you know of any right now? Let me just say briefly, there are currently no clinical trials for, for phage therapy of, 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 of NTM, but, but there is a, a, a growing number, uh, a dozen and a half or so of, of individual compassionate use cases. And, um, the information that's been gleaned from that with, 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 you know, huge thanks to the patients who have participated in those, it forms a solid basis for moving forward with, 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 first of all, with expanded access um, and with, and, and, and then clinical trials. And so the hope is, is that enough information can be gleaned in order to both expand access and, and move trials forward, but, but there's not any available at the moment. Here. Are they are they doing any clinical trials for other pathogens? Any maybe any of the escape pathogens? Yes, yes. There, there's. Uh, I think a, there was a trial approved just very recently, actually, from the San Diego group, the IPATH group that that, that Kira mentioned. I don't remember the specific uh, uh, pathogen profiles. There's a, been a lot of interest in advancing therapy for for um, pathogens such as Pseudomonas, which uh, as many of you will know, is a pretty prominent and difficult uh, organism in the context of uh, of many cystic fibrosis uh, patients. And so um, there's been a lot of action there. And, and, and as I said, some different types of trials have either just started or on the verge of starting for, for, for that pathogen. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a number of questions about phage therapy and mycobacterium avium complex. Um, one person is asking because they were previously told that the, um, the I guess the cell walls of, of MAC don't have a type of side that the phage can attach to in order to infect and eradicate. They wanted to know if that's the case and other people are asking if they've identified phages that are active against MAC. So so let, let me try to address the question in, 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 from, from two perspectives. The first is, you know, are there any phages that infect any MAC strains? And the answer is clearly yes. Um, there are some phages that have been shown to infect some MAC strains. Um, but if you ask the question, are, are there phages that are available for all MAC strains, or for many MAC strains, then the answer to that is no. And so most MAC strains that we and others have looked at, um, it's not been easy to find phages that infect them. We believe that is not because the phages don't exist. It's because we just haven't looked hard enough and in the right places in order to, to gather them. And that's why there's, I think, considerable work needed in the discovery phase in order to, to, to find them. Um, and so I think that's, it's, that's the answer is, is that it should be feasible to find phages that infect and are therap therapeutically useful for many MAC strains, but we certainly don't have them at this point. Um, another question that goes to the point of finding the phages is um, they're asking about the in environmental origins and um, does that mean it's more likely to work on a specific strain if the phage comes from the area where the patient lives or was infected from? And, you know, if, if a patient has lived in a particular area for maybe their whole life and that's where they would have gotten infected, is that a more likely place to look or has that not borne out over time? Um, to my knowledge, that's, th there's not a lot of systematic sort of scientific analysis of that particular question. What we do know though, is, is that if you look at um, the, it, let's take for example, Mycobacterium obsessus and look at the analysis that's been done to compare individual isolates from different patients 
around the globe that they tend to be extremely varied in terms of their genes. So there's a lot of variation. And you can ask the question, well, do patients in a similar geographical area have similar types of bacteria or, or not? Um, and the answer is there appears to be very um, no obvious correlation. And so we've looked at this in some detail. We have patients that we've provided um, phages for therapy, for example, in England and on the east coast of the US, those bacterial strains are extremely similar um, genetically, but they've clearly come from different places. And so it's, it's not obvious that there's any systematic correlation with the acquisition of the infection and, the, and, and what bacteria are present in the environments around that patient. It's a, it's a question that we don't have a clear resolution yet because it's known, for example, that you know, there are NTMs that live in uh, environmentally and in shower heads where they've been found. And so clearly there are opportunities for acquisition of those strains. It's not obvious that that's, that, that's a really tight correlation though. Um, thank you. We've had a few questions also about um, certain strains of other strains of NTM, including obsessus subspecies obsessus and xenopi. Are there strains of uh, are there phages that have been identified against those NTM strains? I think this is another question for me, Kara. Um, <laughs> um, so, so. Uh, let me sort of emphasize once again that it's a rather limited sort of data set uh, that we can talk about. We have been, we've, we, my lab has been sent a relatively large number of strains over the past year and a half to test for phage infection. Most of those strains are Mycobacterium obsessus. And so we, we know quite a lot about the variation of the strains and the ability or not to infect them with, with phages. We have a few um, chimeri strains, uh, Mycobacterium xenopy, uh, I think a couple of chiloni, and, and some Macs that we've looked at. Um, we don't have very many of those other strains. There are at least some strains for which we do have phages. And so we would put that in the category of an area that we would need to learn more about, to get more strains, analyze the profiles. Um, but we, we, we think that most of the um, NTMs that are found clinically, probably we could get phages for those with, with an expanded discovery a program that was really targeting those bacteria. Cl clearly, it's a, very, it's a really important and a very good question. It sort of emphasizes the need to, uh, to take where we're at as a community and to advance that in order to stand more about uh, these other uh, important NTM pathogens. Uh, here's a question um, that I'm, I'm not sure which or both of you might be able to answer, but if the NTM is inside macrophages, can the phage get inside the macrophage to, to infect the NTM? Yeah, well, I will say that Isabel seemed to have been cured with um, use of intravenous bacteria phage cocktail. Um, but I, I agree that that's a theoretical concern and that may be more of an issue for intracellular pathogens like NTM than it is for extracellular pathogens. Um, but if, if it works, then it may be less of a barrier. Uh, just to add, a, it's, it's a really good question. Again, something else we know rather little about, but we're very interested in. And so part, part of the I would see part, part of the consideration is the question as to how dynamic is that relationship uh, between the bacteria and then, of course, the phages and the macrophages. Um, and, you know, there's been some work done in model systems uh, that suggests that that is a very dynamic relationship, which means that um, it's possible that if there are extracellular bacteria that are not in macrophages, but then you add a bacteriophage that infects the bacterium, 
then the infected bacterium might get then taken up by a macrophage and and then the phage would replicate and ex and explode that bacterium and then kill the other bacteria that were previously resident in the ma in the ma in the macrophage and so um i think it's a really important question we need to understand it um i don't it's not obvious because of the clinical experience at this stage that it's an impediment to the to the treatment of of, of ntm infections but something we'd love to know more about and love to know more about the dynamics Thank you. Um, so here's a question. Phages are customized for each patient. Um, I guess the question that they were asking is like, what's the approximate time to find a, the customization? How long does that usually take? So, um, so in practice, what happens is, um, as, as Kira had outlined, a, a strain from a clinical microbiology lab would be sent to us and we would receive that sample and then we would have to grow those bacteria up in the lab and that takes a week or so let's say and then we have to do those plaque assays that i described and we have we have a uh, a small repertoire of our favorite set of phages to test those that we're most likely to be successful with and that's a that's about a couple of dozen phages um it's about a couple of dozen phages but there's maybe a half a dozen in there that are real top favorites the ones that are most likely to work statistically speaking um and and so that analysis takes um a week or two uh and then typically the next stage we would do is to show that when we grow up those bacteria and we infect with the phage that we can actually kill the bacteria and that's another kind of week or two. So we're talking about a series of weeks in order to, to test all of that. Um, again, we have pushed the short end of that um, time frame actually down. I think 10 days was the shortest that we've done, uh, Kira, which was a patient at, in Pittsburgh. And so the paperwork was, was a little bit easier to navigate. Um, um, but to but to do the whole process and to understand all of that can take several weeks. Now, if we don't find a phage in that initial screen, it doesn't rule out the possibility that we will come back and find a phage at a later point. We view the discovery process as an iterative one. And so there have been some strains that we've had an initial failure if we're trying to get that result in a couple of weeks, but have had then some success as we've developed more phages and then put those back into that set of uh, high priority list and, and then learn more about it. So I hope that helps to illuminate a little bit of the process that, 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 that we go through to try to identify suitable phages. Yeah, I think the, the regulatory part took the lion's share and it, it's not just the FDA, it's if you're at different institutions, you know, sending paperwork there, sending a strain there, sending things back, that was, took months. Yep, yep. Uh, here's a question about the, the phage viruses themselves. Do they mutate over time and does the mutation change their ability to infect the bacteria? Um, so yes, phages, like all parts of biology, um, can mutate. That's, that's part of their, their, their nature. They tend not to mutate at very high frequencies. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, how phages like SARS-CoV-2 mutate because they are RNA viruses and they tend to have rather higher rates of mutation. It certainly happens in, in bacteriophages as well. Um, it's not it it's it's not at such a high rate. Now, the main concern we have about what happens to the phages and to the bacteria is the whole uh, idea of bacteria becoming resistant to the phages, as Kira had mentioned, um, and then um, we can. So we can play the the biological game if you like of if the bacteria become resistant to the phage can we find mutants of the phage that overcome the resistance to the 
from the bacterial side. And so um, all of that is something which we observe and can work with in the, in the lab. Um, and, and so these are all mutable systems. Um, the, I, I have to say that from a regulatory point of view, you, you know, the regulators have often raised concerns about whether the, f whether, if you treat a patient with a phage, then if the phage amplifies on the bacterium within the body, as, as Kira mentioned, wh whether you'll end up getting something generated in the, in the, in, in the body, which wasn't there before, sort of mutants of the, of the phage. Um, and it, it's, it, we can't rule out that that would happen, but I think it's very unlikely that it would be a deleterious event. And so it's more a matter of trying to, to understand from a clinical point of view, the rate at which those things happen. When we grow phages in the lab and we sequence their genomes from at least the information that we have, mutations happen um, but it, they don't happen very frequently. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Given the fact that we believe that pulmonary infections with either NTM or other organisms like Pseudomonas have several different strains of each organism, how do you choose a specific phage to kill a variety of strains within the airway or tissue? That's a great question, yeah. Um, for clinically, you know, I sent as many strains as I could get my hands on for my patient that ha had come out of the patient. But you're right that the microbial populations that somebody coughs up might be different than what's actually in their lung. Um, so I think you take your best guess and move forward, sadly. It's inelegant. Yeah, and just to add that of when we've looked at the samples that have been sent to us it's um for a very small number of them not not meaning just two two or three perhaps when we when the bacteria are streaked out and allowed to grow to form colonies on a on a petri dish which is something we do a lot sometimes we can see that that the that there's more than one appearance of a colony type as though you can see visually that there's more than one type there. And so that's happened on a few occasions. But for most samples that at least have come to us from the clinic, um, when we do that, th there seems to be quite a bit of uniformity. And, and at least, as I said, I have to be very careful in saying what, where, this, where the samples come from and what is actually collected and what reflects what's actually going on in the, in, in the infection itself. Uh, most of the samples we've seen are actually pretty uniform, and and um, and in, in, in Isabel's case, for example, I think that there's there's fairly good evidence there that there was really just one predominant strain, and we managed to mostly kill that strain. Um, in, in a small number of other um, uh, occasions where we've we've followed a patient that's being treated, or if we have multiple samples of those of, of of the strain from the same patient. Often, at least the phage infection profile stays the same, uh, perhaps indicating that there's not much change in a predominant group of bacteria within a particular infection, although Kira knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, so there are a few questions about where else the research on, on phage therapy is being done. Somebody has mentioned Eastern Europe, somebody mentioned Russia, um, and somebody else is asking about um, what other communities are involved with this research. Is BARDA involved? Um, is the Pew Charitable Trust involved? Is any of this addressed in the Pasteur and Disarm legislation that's cur currently coming forward? Um, so Kira, Kira maybe I'll answer some of these. I, I, I just say that, um, um, you know, it's, it, it, as Kira said, phage, phage therapy was developed quite extensively early on in, um, in the former Soviet bloc, primarily because Felix Terrell, excuse my French high school, um, moved to Tbilisi in Georgia, where he established a, a, an institute for phage research. Um, 
and uh, and and that continued and so there's still a group in Tbilisi that's very active developing phages for for, for therapies but mostly not NTMs to my to my understanding and there's been very few IV administration of, of phages there because uh, IV administration is a little bit more scary right from a safety point of view as a group in Poland that's been fairly active although not with NTMs to my knowledge but then there are people uh, throughout there's now several groups in Europe involved in phage therapy there's a there's a quite a big center at Yale um, Yale University led by uh, Ben Chan John Koff and and uh, and Paul Turner uh, who are looking at uh, a lot of pseudomonas uh, infections has been a, a primary primary interest in terms of funding uh, the the NIH is funding some of this phage therapy related work now um, in different areas cystic fibrosis foundation is is interested and in funding some some work um, I'm uh, the Navy has had a long-standing interest and and has funded a lot of this work internally um, I'm not sure I know about all of the other uh, entities or the Kira may know of, of some. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know what who's funding phage research these days. As I said, I'm more of a mycobacteria person, not a phage person. Yeah. I, I just add that there are some, you know, there's there's been a string of startup companies that have come and gone over the years, but including several that have emerged relatively recently. And... Um, um, and and that that have actually gotten quite quite well funded, um, and so I think that there's there's a the prospects that there are a variety of different types of investment which which could help to advance this this whole area. Um, here's a question about phage resistance. So if that occurs, does that mean there might be a different phage that could be effective as well, or does the resistance end up? coming across the board because of the strain of bacteria? The reason why we wanted to use a cocktail for treating Isabel in that first case that, that we talked about was because we were concerned that if we gave one uh, phage that we would just end up with resistance to it and then that would, would, would be done essentially. Um, and uh, just as uh, three antibiotics are typically used to treat uh, tub tuberculosis infections and, and obviously antibiotic uh, combinations are used to treat other NTMs as well, that was the strategy and why we chose to go for, go for the three-phage cocktail. Um, at this point now, um, a few months later, we know quite a lot about the frequencies of resistance to phages by different strains and by different phages. And it varies every, every combination of a strain of M abscessus and a phage that you use, you see something different. However, in general, the frequency of resistance appears to be very low, sometimes in our hands, not detectable, not at a detectable level. And as we begin to characterize resistance, we have reason to believe, although we need to learn more, but we have reason to believe that resistance may not be completely neutral in terms of the virulence of the bacteria. So even though you may get a resistant strain in the lab, it doesn't, that resistant strain may not be viable or, or successful in the infectious environment. If that's true, then, then phage resistance may not be nearly as big a problem as we had anticipated it would be for treating the NTMs. This is another area that, that my lab is actively looking at. And uh, uh, we, we think that, it's, that in many instances, when we've screened strains, we've only been able to find a single phage that might be therapeutically useful. But we have been able to go ahead and use it therapeutically without too much of a concern about resistance simply because we haven't observed resistance uh, in the lab in the in vitro situation. So mu much to be learned. It's a really interesting topic. And, and finding out if a, if a strain becomes resistant to one phage, does it come resistant to other phages? Um, why are some strains apparently resistant to the phages to begin with? And what can you do about it? These are, these are the key questions in terms of the microbiology that, that, that we would just love to understand.
Do you see the infection reemerge later on, or is that more driven by the underlying comorbidity that, that made them susceptible to infection in the first place? Kira, did you want to reflect well, I, on that? Yeah, I, sadly, I think some of the phage efficacy has been really poorly reported. And so usually pe people are only reporting the initial response to infection and not the long-term outcomes that are beyond the length. So I, I don't know of circumstances. I, so there, there, there are episodes of treatment failure. Um, in particular, um, there's some people with ventric, there's some literature on um, pseudomonal bacteremia in patients with ventricular assist devices where phage can clear the bacteria from a bloodstream infection and then the bacteria can reemerge later. Um, so, but you know, everybody is different. Every patient is different. I think the relevance for NTM in the lung is something that um, the, there's a lot of that, that should be an area of active investigation to know whether we can eradicate and then hope that we don't get reinfection again with the use of phage. I should just add parenthetically that, that one of the encouraging indicators is that at least the safety profiles to date look pretty good. Now, there's lots of things to worry about with, with safety with phages. It's not just the phages themselves, but what happens when you start killing and as they would say, lysing or breaking open large numbers of bacteria in the body. What's the, what are the consequences of that? So there's lots of things to be concerned about, but all the data to date suggests that um, these are really good safety profiles and safety profiles over extended periods of time. So in terms of this question, um, it, it's quite reasonable to entertain plausibly if you need to quite long prolonged treatments uh, with phages without adverse effects. You just worry about uh, re resistance and other, other bodily reactions to the phages, but the phages themselves should stay safe. And clearly that's in contrast to m some or many of the antibiotics that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with, which uh, have just, you know, I, I just recognize now these devastating side effects, especially with extended uh, periods of administration. And so, that's the good news is that the phages have that good safety profile and extended treatments uh, is, is, uh, is, 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 is likely to be more, more, more feasible. Um, somebody's asking about the cost of, of all of this to create a phage or like a phage therapy. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the cost and who bears that cost currently? Well, I think there's 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 two aspects because um, you know this is uh, you, you know I've I, let me just sort of illustrate by you, you know the collaboration I've had with 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 Kira uh, who is a, you know a brilliant physician which is we just had a it's a great collaboration working together and the costs are borne on both sides um, from from my perspective. Um, so I run a research lab that's well funded, uh, reasonably well funded to address basic biological questions by screening the strains and by understanding the variation uh, provides a valuable insight and a, and a tool for us to, uh, to understand um, the basic biology. And so this satisfies our interests in addressing these basic questions whilst having, as it were, a, a side effect um, uh, in developing the therapeutic utility and 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 so and so we we do not we do not pass any of those costs on to the to to our uh, cl clinician phys physician uh, collaborators we bear those costs clearly not everybody could do that and it's not that there aren't costs involved it's just that they're absorbed through um, through the broader scientific process but but it, it, Kira's ends, there's, there's considerable costs associated which have to be borne somehow as well. So for, from our end, the costs are that, um, so this is phager being provided for compassionate use um, is the way that they're categorized as the FDA. And insurance companies aren't required to pay for anything that's for compassionate use, especially for something that isn't 
uh, you know, a, a strictly um, by the books FDA approved product off the shelf. And so um, for compassionate use, um, I'm not allowed to charge um, any patient, any cost, anything related to phage therapy. And so for phage therapy, there's some um, healthcare costs associated with monitoring um, phage safety. Insurance can't pay those costs. Um, monitoring, um, you know, any of the, we, the, all of the shipping that Dr. Hatful does to send us phage is for, that's not, can't be, uh, the, in these things, um, you know, can't be sent fully at room temperature. Things need to be kept cold. All of the supplies, all of the vials to administer it, um, all of the, the, the physician and coordinator time for all the regulatory paperwork. It was, you know, hours and hours and hours. And all of that is um, from philanthropic costs or for research costs, but can't be born, can't be charged to insurance um, or charged to the patient. Thank you. Um, somebody's asking about where these phage ther therapy centers are located. Um, we know there's one in San Diego. Um, there's one in, in Pittsburgh and, and Kira, you've, you've been working with them out of Hopkins. Um, where are there, are there others, you know, where, where are they in the United States at least? I mean, I think it's been fairly decentralized. I think um, I would ask Graham if there's any other centralized centers, but that's one of the things is that, um, you know, uh, Graham has been working with people, not just in the US, but all around the globe on mostly one-off collaborations for a particular single patient. And so that's part of why this has been hard to scale. Um, you know, it's not just personalized in terms of the phage matching with the, with the bacteria, but also having a, you know, a number of patients who are similar, who would qualify for phage, um, who would be recommended to have a particular product at a particular dose with a particular route, um, these things haven't been standardized. So I think it's mostly one off um, and then the centralized, I think you've named. Yeah, there's there's also a, um, a, cent, a center, I don't, I'm not quite sure what's the right name, but uh, an organization being developed, a group of, of folks at, at the Mayo Clinic as well um, that yeah, are trying. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and Yale, which is, you, we mentioned Yale, the San Diego, the iPath of San Diego. And, uh, and then at Pittsburgh, there's, there's an organization that's been called the Pittsburgh Phage Project or P3, which is trying to organize, um, you know, so that there is coordinated expertise and movement at both the basic research level, but also on the clinical uh, administration um, as well. But Kira's point is is absolutely right. The the we've been we have been been sent samples and we have sent phages for for clinical administration uh, all across the the globe. And so you know many places in Europe, um, Barcelona more recently, Australia, obviously United Kingdom, um, Ireland, Helsinki, um, across the U.S. Alaska, <laughs> it's 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 very decentralized, and um, where the phage discovery part is done by us, but then the phys physicians and the patients are are, are broadly distributed. I, I, I agree, it's not um, it's not the best way that you would like to do it, but um, but I see us as taking small but important sort of baby steps that will get us towards a more coordinated. Uh, set of clinical trials and therapies. Okay, um, somebody was asking about the sampling. Um, is for getting samples of of the bacteria. You you mentioned that it's it's basically you're you're getting isolates, so it's not coming from a sputum sample, correct? It's already been isolated at the lab. From for Dr. Hatful's group, yeah. um, the, the yeah. bacteria have to be isolated before you ship to him. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, so I saw the question about whether a bronchoscopy would be better. Um, you know, I think that needs to be answered not on the phage level, but kind of on a NTM bacterial level of, you know, are the contents of bacteria in sputum different than what we recover from a bronchoscopy with lavage? And I think that should be answered on a, a kind of a genomic and a population level separate from the utility of phage therapy and whether 
um, Bronx specimens are better than expectorated sputum. But it's a very good question. And they're almost certainly potentially different populations, um, but perhaps not so, and perhaps not for all patients. Yeah, key questions. I know that some, some there are folks that are trying to understand those questions. I think the groups at uh, Colorado that Kira and I have both worked with as well um, are really interested in trying to understand some of those questions outside of the immediate question of, of, of phage therapy. Okay. Um, so we have a few more questions. Um, I'm going to uh, send some of the comments we have to you because some of the comments and questions are asking what patients can do to help move this along and help you guys with the research. So I'm gonna get that information from you so we can start putting together some ideas on how to do that. Um, somebody was asking, um, is there, you know, that a lot of this is being done on CF patients. Like, are, have you done this on non-CF patients as well? Yeah, so my patient who's being treated with phage is not a CF patient. Um, I, I don't, you know, this is not, as I said, there's only, the only published report of uh, phage for mycobacteria is Dr. Hatfuls of the CF patient. So it's hard to know the full clinical details of the other patients. Um, but the group at Yale is focused on CF, but they, uh, in a conversation with them, they told me that they're interested in doing um, nebulized phage for non-CF bronchiectasis. So I think that's an interest that's coming down the road, but I don't think there's anything actively in place for that currently. Okay. Um, I think we will uh, take one more question. Um, <clears throat> So besides uh, the, the patient in the UK, how, how do you know of more than one or two patients where the, uh, er, the infection was eradicated? Like, is that something that you've seen? It's not just a one-off when you're doing the phage treatment? Let, let, let me just say first, good, uh, I'm going to let Kira comment as well, but um, we, we um, I don't have a recent update, but um, I, I think that uh, for the patient that we treated in London, that would that would still not be considered at this stage, to my knowledge, an an eradication, right? And so, completely getting rid of the bacteria, you know, with especially with with immunocompromised, immunosuppressed patients, you know, may maybe maybe a very tough tough haul, um, and it may be that one just has to continue the pressure uh, with the phages over an extended period of time. And so um, the, there's no there's no other patients that have been treated as long as that, um, and the total number of patients that we've been involved in providing phages for, it's about it's about a dozen and a half, something like that. And 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 most of that is not published, and most of it is ongoing, and it's sort of a fairly complicated series of outcomes. But um, but uh, there's. I, I, there's another uh, case that is very similar in profile to the one that, that I described earlier, also CF, also immunosuppressed uh, following lung transplantation, um, who, who is doing in, in incredibly well after about six months of, of, of therapy. So we're talking about a very small number of cases um, and, and for everyone we're learning from them. And I just, I have to, I uh, just express my gratitude to both the patients, of course, but the sheer bravery of the physicians who choose to jump into this very difficult area as well. And so um, we're, we're, we're learning and it's not easy. And I'd like to think that the prospects remain very good. It is just unclear how we get to a more generalizable um, uh, application so that we can maximize the utility for patients that suffer from NTM infections. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Thank you for taking the time to answer all of those questions. There were quite a number of them. We have a few more and I may kick a couple of them over to you by email to, to get some answers. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today for the webinar. Um, we are planning a, a really great series of, of educational webinars throughout the year. So we look forward to seeing more of you in, in, in the future. Dr. Hatful, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we, we found your presentations fascinating. 
And we were very excited to learn about this, this amazing new therapeutic area that we hope to see continue developing a lot more uh, in the future. Uh, everybody, thank you for attending. Have a wonderful week and weekend, and we will see you soon. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.